two weeks ago I posted a vlog where you could follow along a week of my life where I showed you how I wear kimono every single day and how I deal with wearing kimono every single day. And yes, I do have a wardrobe that works quite well for me wearing kimono every single day, but I'm missing still a few items to make kimono even more convenient for me. And those two items is what I'm going to make today. In case you're here for the first time, my name is Billy Matsunaga and I'm a fully trained and certified kimono teacher and stylist. I think I should give you a little bit of backstory of why I'm making this video, although it's not even on my list for planned content or anything, but I just thought I'm gonna make this video. <laughs> Here it is. I went to Tokyo last month and I went to the garment district and I found this beautiful hedgehog fabric which is just perfect for me because I am not a lover of animal print. Not at all. But that fabric from far away looks like just dots which is perfect. But when you look very close it's hedgehogs. And in case you don't know, yes I do have a pet which is a hedgehog. His name is Franze. And he's the cutest hedgehog on earth. I mean, yes, everyone says it about their pet, but I really do believe so. <laughs> and I was standing in the store, really wanting the fabric, but having no idea what to make with it. So I took pictures and I went back home or to my hotel room. I was asking my Instagram followers. <laughs> they were much more creative than I was. <laughs> and two of my favorite ideas is what I am making now. So this is the fabric I have purchased with small little hedgehogs on it and even sparkly golden hedgehogs. By the way, this is my favorite here. Francis so often looks like this. <laughs> it's so extremely cute. And I have pre-washed and pre-ironed it. And the first thing I'm gonna make of this is something I was always tempting to make is a so-called Kapogi. Kapogi is this kind of apron you wear over a kimono and you tie it here on the back together. And I have yesterday evening I have already um, drafted this pattern. Just the top I just did it from here to here because this bottom is all going to be straight. And I've also done a sleeve pattern. I also had to change this because 40 centimeter sleeve length is way too short for me. Um, I did 50 centimeter because I really have long arms. I have really long arms. And this is going to be put onto the fabric like this. So I'm now going to fold up the fabric as it's shown here. So I can use this pattern just here on the top. I'm gonna fold it and when I fold it up it's gonna look like this. I'm gonna cut it out like this and as well the sleeves and this part here says can be used for the tie and the pocket and this is what I'm gonna do as well. Um, this here says this is a 90 centimeter wide fabric with 190 centimeter length. For the kabuki they give me a total length of 110 centimeter which is from my height extremely long but I'm just gonna keep it as it is because you know this is one of the real free sizes you actually have it doesn't really matter and I also checked 90 centimeter is more than I need to wrap around my kimono so I'm fine with this size so I kept this as it is and I just lengthened the sleeve here the book suggested to cut on the fold in a very specific way. First I started by folding the width in half. Then I measured 20 cm from the edge and folded the fabric along this line once more. Then I made sure that I really had 25 centimeter showing on the top 
all through the strip that was in front of me. I laid out the pattern on top and really made sure I didn't do anything wrong. And then I pinned the pattern on and cut. I was never so nervous to cut into fabric before, so I was really, really thrilled that it worked out. Finally, the lace arrived that I had ordered online and it's really, really sweet and sparkly. <laughs> And I don't want to use this lace alone because it would be a little lonely. So I found this lace in a fabric store after I've been to four more fabric stores. And I really find it quite matching together. Look at this. It will look really good. I'm only going to use this close to the hem. And... I also needed some lace to pair with this one here on the collar and on the sleeves. And I only could find something I like in pure white cotton. Which means I will have to dye this. I got this dye in beige and a color stop for it. And yeah, I will have my husband helping me because I usually tend to not read the instructions really carefully because that's me. My husband is the quite opposite. He first reads all the instructions super carefully and then he starts doing something. So when I do something like this, it's really cool when he helps me. So let's do this. Yes, I dyed the lace and actually filmed it, but my footage disappeared. So let's skip ahead. So this is the outcome <laughs> of the dyeing process. <laughs> it is definitely not the color I was going for. And I did some calculations and tried to calculate down how much I would actually need. But you can tell I do not have enough detailed dyeing knowledge to actually be able to do it. This was the color I was going for, right? In the end, I was kind of like, I could have just put this in coffee and washed it. And it would probably have been exactly this color. I like it way more than white, definitely. So that is why I'm also going to use this. And also because the fabric store, I've sent my husband there. This lace was sold out in three days. I bought it like three days earlier and my husband went there one day, like three days later, and it was already sold out. I mean, come on. It's obviously, it's really hard to find lace. And I've already started to make at least one sleeve. I have already the lace inserted. It's so cute. I love it so much. I decided where I want to place um, my laces with this sleeve here, and now I'm gonna Mark this out on this sleeve, gonna cut it down, and I'm gonna start to insert the lace, which is, by the way, not a lot of work. I am also using the machine. I also, by the way, just to tell you that I know the width I wanna have for my first lace, and I'm gonna first insert that lace, and after that, I am going to put in the other lace because I do not trust my calculating skills. <laughs> I'm honestly, I'm already convinced that if I would try to calculate it, that I would not be able to do this like right or in any good way. So um, I'm going this way. You're allowed to hate me for it, but for all those peeps out there who also not like a math um, genius 
Yes, you can sew without being a math, gen math genius, it's fine. You will just have probably to do more work. So I pinned on the lace, sewed it and finished off the edges by hand. By the way, now I think I should have done French seams to be a little faster when making this, but who cares, hand sewing is fun. Anyway, kapogi means literally translated wear for cooking. It is an apron with sleeves that is meant to protect the kimono from spattering oil or else when cooking. Until kapogi came in fashion, tusky paired with an apron was common. We don't actually know by whom and when kapogi was exactly invented, but all theories about its origin range from 1901 to 1904, so it is definitely an invention during the turn of the century. In Taisho era, kapogi were promoted as wear for the household, and by Showa period one couldn't imagine a Japanese housewife without wearing a white kapogi. After making a rolled hem and the sleeve openings, I put an elastic into it, which is really annoying, I know. and sew the two elastic edges together with a zigzag stitch. And then I stitched the open sides together with a tiny whip stitch. And the sleeves were finally finished and we could get on to more lace insertion but before we do that here is some garden action. featuring dirty fingernails in the following shots. Okay, so it's finally time to put on this very, very sweet um, embroidered tool lace that I have purchased online at a store that is called Hana Cafe. I'm going to link their Instagram down below. When you love at looking at lace at na <laughs> when you love looking at super cute lace like me, this is your account. <laughs> this lace is definitely embroidered with silk thread. When you can tell when you touch it, so I won't be able to wash this. So I will have to put this on, so I can actually take this out later, so I can put everything into the washing machine and then sew it in, like back in. I decided to cut the length in two pieces where I want to insert the lace. And I have already started to insert it here on one side, you can see. I have already hemmed those two parts nicely where the lace is going to be on. And then I sewed it on very delicately, delicately by hand um, with a running stitch so it's easier to take it out later and I did a back stitch every five to six stitches I think to make it a little more sturdy because when I only tried running stitch at one edge it was not really holding it nice enough. <laughs> Mm -hmm. 
The lace insertion is finally done and it was such a struggle, especially the collar. But does it look really good as a first try? You have to be honest, this does look good. Um, I really have to thank Marlies from Little Crocus because she even sent me a video. She sat down and made a video for me to show me how I can do the color line. And if she wouldn't have done that, this would not have been possible. So I am so thankful for having her in my life. Thank you so much. I have no footage of this <laughs> because I did it for the first time. It took a few tries on every single lace and every single side I did. And I didn't want to be bothered with setting, at a, setting up a camera and being pressured with doing it right or showing it right in some way. So I'm happy I didn't because there was definitely a lot of cursing <laughs> and a lot of crying <laughs> but in the end it really looks good and I'm actually super happy I finished this off like this my sewing book actually told me to either do a facing to finish off the color line or just put some lace onto it like you know this lace that is already hemmed and looks like a hem not lace insertion just sewing it on both of those would have been way easier to be honest and when you don't want to struggle with lace insertion i do recommend to do either of those anyway now it's time to sew on the sleeves and i have already finished off a few ties that will be sewed onto this and then we're finished after finishing the shoulder seams i gathered the top of the sleeves and sewed them on with french seams and after sewing on the ties the kapogi was finished So now that my kapogi is done, it's finally time to tackle the second project of this video, a mompe. It is not the first time I'm making a mompe on this channel, but it's the first time of making a mompe with an actual vintage pattern or with actual vintage instructions. The mompe I made earlier on this channel was a modern mompe. I received the pattern from my sewing teacher it completely works but it is not what you would have done when you put a when you turn a kimono into a mompe what was done during the war and we're going to talk about that in a few moments yesterday evening i cut off my swing code mock-up and turned it into a mompe mock-up um, i'm actually glad i <laughs> have done this because it answered a few of my questions that I had with the instructions so today I can start to tackle this whole mompe and share with you the right way how to make this. So it says I have to cut out the fabric like this and then assemble it like this. <laughs> and I can tell you this was heavily confusing at first time thanks to my mock-up I found out what to do. Also, while I have the length of every single fabric piece here, I do not have any width here. And because I know that Mombe were made of former kimono, I am going for a kimono bow width here, which is 
36 centimeter I think I will go with that because that was a very common width in history for kimono bolts and because my fabric has a width of 110 centimeter I made a little sketch to calculate out how much I would absolutely actually have to cut out so I need two front pieces two back pieces one center piece and one smaller center piece because they're all 95 long I need a total length of 190 my width is 110 which means I'm, I can do two rows of a 36 centimeter width which is a which is what I will probably do because I'm gonna take the last part here and make um, ties and all the other stuff out of this probably also pockets and I probably will calculate a tiny bit more because I want to probably do French seams because I do not have enough time to sew this because the kapoki took off so much time so probably French seams will be easier I started by cutting 36 centimeter strips. By the way, when you've already cut one strip, you can use it as a guide to cut along instead of having to measure again. I cut one of the strips in half to create two front pieces. I kept the other strip on the fold and marked out the center piece, or machi, that is apparently translated with gusset. And after cutting that out, I had one big triangular shape as a gusset and two back pieces. Then I marked out the aibiki, or side seam, on the straight line of the back pieces and also on the front pieces, on just only one side. Length is the length I also used in my hakama video, so make sure to check that out. The third strip of fabric was cut into ties for back and front and a second smaller gusset. I pin together the center back seam and the two gussets and sew them all together with a French seam. Then I pinned the gusset and back pieces together. Luckily I noticed before sewing that I pinned one side wrong and changed it right away. But you know what, I do this a lot when doing French seams, so... What I have noticed when I did my mock-up yesterday is that obviously the center back seam here or this little rectangular thing <laughs> for the center back seam is obviously seam allowance because when you put on the machi this is what I have left over which is exactly this rectangular cutout 
but I do ne need this width on the bottom that goes to, down to the bottom hem. So I have definitely done nothing wrong. I think I just should have set my seam here. Sorry, again, here, not direct at the edge where you usually do. Which makes sense, yeah, this is kimono sewing. It makes sense and there is nothing written like that in the instructions, which is also clear because the book I'm using is actually a textbook from a women's university, which means they use this in class, which means they usually get instructions in class. And other textbooks I have like this, they actually have notes written into the book which I usually don't write in books, but the more I buy old books, the more I find those little memos, notes, way more helpful. <laughs> but anyway, I think I'm just gonna do another seam, straight seam, just straight down here to make it look like a tuck or something. And I'm probably gonna bind this raw edge that I have now here on the inside. With some bias binding, probably bias binding. After fixing said problem, I went ahead and pinned each of both front pieces onto each side of the gusset. And I pinned the top of the two front pieces together that will form the center front seam. After French seaming this, I marked out a seam allowance of the leg opening so I could create a rolled hem. Mompe are basically hakama with a gusset and tightened legs, but they are wide enough on the top to wear it over a kimono. It is said that Mompe started to spread from northeast Japan throughout the country. And you can already spot them in woodblock prints from the 18th century. They were worn for daily work and especially worn by female farmers. However, mompe were also very popular to be worn in winter to stay warm. In the Second World War, mompe were promoted as clothing for emergency. And you can find several sewing instructions in magazines from the end of the 1930s to 1942. During that time, many kimono were re-sewed into mompe and a shirt for said reason. And by the way, according to the region, Mompe is called very differently. You will also find words like Yamabakama, Yukibakama, Karusan, Susohoso, and more. But Mompe is probably the most common name used for it in modern Japanese. In the meanwhile, I have now finished pinning the Aibiki or side seams together. Wrong side and wrong side, because we're doing a French seam here. And after sewing together, that you cut off the seam allowance and make sure not to cut into your actual seam. And then you turn it over so you have no right side on right side and you're pinning this together. And after sewing that down, you have a finished French seam, which means you don't have to do anything further with your seam. It is just finished as it is. And that's why I love French seams. <sighs> so we have come this far. This is the back and it looks like it's supposed to look. Right now it looks more like this here. <laughs> and I'm so happy. Um, by the way, they also actually let you do a separate piece on the hem here. I decided not to do that because I'm pretty sure that this was actually to t actually take this off, be able to wash this and put it back on so you wouldn't have to wash the whole thing. That's why I think they did this. Um, but this um, Mompe has enough 
length for me. So I'm gonna skip this special piece here, but I'm super happy. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna do Sasahida because this sewing pattern actually lets me do Sasahida. Um, for reference, also watch my how to make a Hakama video. For this Monpe, they did not tell me which size of Sasahida I should use. So I decided to use the back Sasahida of my Hakama measurements on all four um, Sasahida. You can also check out my how to make a Hakama video for this. So first of all, I'm gonna start out with marking out six centimeter on the top. And then I curve this down to the top of the side seam. And then I'm also gonna mark out four centimeter on the top. And I am going to curve that down as well. And then I'm gonna start to fold this up. So I'm starting to fold first this edge inside to the four centimeter marking. And then I'm folding it up again to at the six centimeter marking. And I'm gonna iron that down. And then I'm turn this. And I try to have the fashion fabric here showing here on the back for about five millimeter but this time i honestly went with a little less so i'm just gonna do two to three millimeter back here this time and when you fold this up again you wanna sew down right next to this fold here which I'm gonna do now. I am going to sew this down by hand and you can do it with machine as well. No worries. I'm gonna sew it down by hand. And when you have this sewed down, you fold this here back over. And then you will have to blind stitch those two edges here together, which usually takes the most time. Sometimes they're really hard to do. Um, you have to get used to them. But I can also tell you that I have touched so many hakama in my kimono teacher life or just being into kimono. There are also so many different shapes of sasahida out there because I think every kimono sewing teacher or tailor, wasaishi, do have their own tricks to work with that. So mm, don't be too perfectionist with them, I think. And now that my sasahida are all done, the only thing I have to do now is pleat this hakama and then sew the ties on and they're finished. <laughs> Okay, so I'm a little bit confused about the ties. Good morning, by the way. <laughs> the ties should be super easy, but the problem is it tells me that the back, sorry, weird finger, the back tie is this one big piece here. And this is the front tie for sure, which are those two long pieces, which is just long piece I have to cut in the middle, which I already did because I know that a hakama tie has to be 300, 
about 360 I think this giving me a tiny bit more a tiny bit less but it's about 300 something so that's why this makes sense just the back tie with 140 is really short but actually folding it up like this will give it a way more stiffness than the fabric actually has and because you usually would put some interfacing into the back tie to really have a really nice crisp back it would make sense to just fold this up and then sew it on so i'm probably just gonna try it like this so i'm just gonna sew it on just fold this up into this width and then sew it on and for the front tie i'm going to sew these two pieces here together and just make a very long front tie and back to the usual tie sewing madness first pinning the front tie onto the front and sewing it down then ironing in the seam allowance that I had already marked out. I finished off the ends of the ties first. You'll find this way of finishing the ends of collars and obi and also ties in several of my videos. So I'm skipping the explanation this time. By the way, nice job camera for not focusing on the band-aid and too late. Lastly, it's only folding over and then sewing almost five meter of ties. I usually blind stitch this, but this time I was lazy and did it by machine. My Mompe looks great. I love it so much. I love that from far away you can tell us hedgehogs. I love the golden details on it with those little golden hedgehogs. And still, yes, I will be able to work with this in the garden, which just makes it super perfect. And I am really happy. And for the Kapogi, the lace insertion went better than I thought, but I could have also done a better job. But for the first time, I think it really looks okay. Also, I do regret a little bit to use that super, super nice Indian embroidered tool lace because now I'm 100% sure I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna wear this kapogi for cooking. <laughs> but you would probably spot it really in future videos because sewing in it is really fun because I don't have to be careful about my actual kimono sleeves. That's actually pretty cool. So it's probably more like a sewing outfit. If you like this video, leave me a thumb up and share it. That would help me out a lot. And if you're not subscribed yet, but you want to learn more from a professional kimono teacher, make sure to subscribe. And I'll talk to you in my next video, which will be definitely a way more laid back video. Bye.